So listen, there's uh, the fire department called. I mean, they came over here, and uh, they said, they said, uh, well, they came and got me out of Bible class uh, and wanted to see me. And I came up and said, we got some families that are misplaced, and they don't have anything, don't have any where to stay. They don't have, we, we kept them at the fire, but we're just not equipped for that. And the Red Cross isn't set up for whatever reason for that. And, I, and they came to us to see if we could help. I said, sure, we'll put them in a motel a couple, three nights. We'll help them get refigured out and help them with money for food because one of them, they don't have any food money or anything. I mean, they had lost everything. And they're, they, were, they were, you know, struggling anyway, right? And there's a couple individuals and then this family, they even have a baby and all of that. And uh, I said to the fire guy, I said, uh, his, his name is uh, uh, the fireman Mikovich. Mik yeah, Milkovich. And uh, I said, why did you come here? He said, because you're the church that everybody knows helps people. That's why, he said. And he said, we all knew that immediately and, uh, at, at the station. And we said, let's take them over and see if they'll help out what they could do. So we're going to do a dollar blessing. Say, Pastor, we could just take it out of the general fund. We can. But let me tell you, when there's a need, it's good that we give. And so the early service, we didn't know this. It was at Sunday school. Some of them in classes were able to participate, but just come down and do what you can do. You don't, you know, I know everybody doesn't have anything to give, but guys, go ahead and let's help these people out. And because we do love people. We love everybody. Okay, so let me think what else. Pastor Hawkins, uh, a week from Sunday, starting on a Sunday night, a three-week series, and you don't want to miss those Sunday night services, July 8, 15 to 22. He's got a great series about, uh, I forget the title of it, it's in your bulletin. And then uh, also, I wanted to mention that tonight we have some special music. The first 30 minutes is going to be patriotic music, okay? You with me? Y'all listening? Don't lose me. And, uh, and then we're going to have some good gospel music as well, so all music night. And we've got people like HK singing and uh oh uh mike kling and smith and, and his sister jennifer who's now married and she's fuqua because that sounds cooler than kling and smith and she got married and uh let's see like loveless is and i forget who all singing but anyway uh, uh oh phil's gonna play uh his harmonica and we're honoring veterans tonight so six o'clock come on out and join us all right and thanks to Stanton Madsen, in the early service we got here, we had lightning, and none of these lights were working, and he figured it out, because he's the fix everything, do all guy. Give Stanton a big thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the little woman here that directed the choir and the orchestra, Pastor uh, Brett is kind of mentoring her. This is her kind of degree, and so she's getting a lot of practice this summer, and so what a great opportunity. And so I'll say thank you to Mariah, and then also Olivia Pruitt's back from Turkey, right? That's where you went. And we're glad to have you back. And she said it was an amazing, and thank you to all of you who made it possible for her to go. Now take your Bibles and turn to John 8, 31 to 36. Take your Bibles, John 8. And then also... Let me mention that we started this series called I Am Who You Say I Am, meaning Satan lies to you in many ways, and he beats you down, and everything that God stands for, he stands for the opposite, and everything that's truth, he has a lie to combat that. And uh, so uh, we started out with Pastor Jeff. Boy, if you missed a sermon, I don't remember what Sunday it was, but it was four weeks ago. Uh, let's see, not four from the day, five from today. And he, th he preached the truth that you're loved by God and God is crazy about you, loves you to pieces. But, the, but the, the lie of the enemy is you're not good enough and you don't measure up. And Brian preached about that we are sent forth as ambassadors. We're ambassadors. And the lie that Satan wants to tell you is that you're not qualified to be ambassadors. You're not good enough to do that. And that we're agents of God. I like that. You know, I like that, uh, you know, secret agent type of guy. Only we're public agents, right? And uh, the lie is that it's an impossible task. You can never do it. Okay? I feel a little loud. Am I loud? Okay. I'm old.
It really bothers me to follow Pastor Zach and then Pastor Austin because they're young. Then I get up here and I'm 65 and I look old, but I, I look like 90 after they get through preaching. So those of you with imagination, just picture me like I used to look when I was 22. Those of you that knew me, just picture me that way. Pastor Zach, don't laugh. Pastor Zach, last uh, two weeks ago, he preached about Satan lying, that there's something better than what God has for you. And when you believe that and you go down that path, then he lies to you and says, you've done too much to be forgiven. But the truth is that you're an heir of God, join heirs with Jesus Christ, and that he still loves you. He reaches with his mercy. He reaches with his grace. And no matter what, he's got you. Okay, He's going after you. And then Austin preached last week on the lie that uh, Satan will tell you, you've done too much wrong to be saved. But the truth is, God's love is ineffable, which means inexplainable, totally like impossible to describe. And then the second lie was, I need to earn my salvation. The truth is that salvation is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. You cannot earn your salvation. It's like there's a, the sin has made such a gap between us and God that there's no way that anything you can do would fix that. It's only what Jesus can do. And today, I want to talk about freedom. I'm glad we're free, and thank you for serving. And those of you that have relatives that gave the ultimate sacrifice, serving that we can have freedom in our nation. But the freedom the Bible speaks of is the freedom, as Pastor Kerry mentioned, that comes in Jesus Christ, freeing us from our selfishness, from our stubbornness, from our greed, from our lust, from our hatred, from our pride, freeing us from sin so that we're not captive, we're not in grips, we're not in bondage. We're free in Jesus Christ, and Jesus does that. And, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that he does. And the title of the message is Free to Love. Why are we set free? Just so we don't go and be punished after we die? Why are we free? We're free to love. There's a, there's a uh, uh, song Gaither's, uh, Gaither's um, wrote, and I love the song. Uh, how many of you want me to sing it? Raise your hand and sing it a little bit. How many of you want me to just say the words? Put them down, boys. Put them down. <laughs> I'm going to sing it. Pastor Brett just had to step out in the foyer, so here I go. <laughs> Boy, he, that guy can sing, can he? He goes, I am loved, you are loved, I can risk loving you, we are free to love each other, cause we are loved. The verse goes, forgiven, I'm forgiven, and clean before my Lord, I freely stand, forgiven, I can dare forgive my brother forgiven i reach out to take your hand i am loved you are loved won't you please take my hand we are free to love each other we are loved and the whole gospel is this yeah oh yeah You guys are starved for entertainment. <laughs> oh, we're free to love. And, um, and the great, the, the whole, whole gospel is this, the loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, and that's Christianity. Love God, you put your faith in God, he puts his love in your heart, and you love others. So today I want to have you search your heart to see if you're either Believe falsely that you're a child of God, but you're really not. Or maybe you aren't sure that if you were to pass this day that you'd miss heaven, that you would not go to heaven, you don't believe you would. Or you know you're a believer, but you're a little bit empty and you need something more poured into you, which is the divine power of his spirit, which is love. The fruit of the spirit, it says in Galatians, is love, period. And then the other fruits describe what love is. Just like 1 Corinthians when Paul writes there and he writes the definition of love. We use it at weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is 
Love is, uh, doesn't bear grudges. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. It forgives. It believes the best. It hopes the best. Uh, it bears all things. It hopes all things. This love is amazing. It's not arrogant and boastful and selfish. This is love. And so what God does to set us free is set us free from self that we might love. And listen, here's the deal. It comes from the heart. Now, if you miss this, you're going to miss everything that I have to say. The heart is not just emotion or feeling. Look, it's not just emotion or feeling. Okay? It's also thinking, note takers. How do you say that, Pastor Zach? Note takers are world changers. If you want to write that down, that's it. Emotions, uh, your, your heart is not just emotions, but it's thinking. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The Bible talks about renewing your mind by the Word of God. And that when you get full of the Word and the Spirit quickens it, it comes in and changes your heart. And you become a new man, a new creation. And He fills you up as you put your faith fully, repent from your sin. And Jesus is alive in you and expresses itself in love. That's why there's so many things that God hates. Proverbs talks about things that, hey, they're the things that aren't love, right? God hates anything that isn't love. He hates the religious spirit of the day when he was on earth. And his harshest words were for them because they lived out right and wrong, but their hearts were full of hatred and judgmental and meanness. Their heart wasn't full of love. So I'm going to give you three lies and three truths. And we're free to love. And one of Satan's lies is this. And, and, and here's, here's the thing. Here's why I need you to get a hold of this. Because at the close of the service, I'm going to ask you to respond that if there's any part of your heart that needs to be changed, only God can change it. You may be born again, truly saved, headed to heaven. You may not be sure. You may not know Christ at all. You may know that you, you would not make heaven. It doesn't matter where you are. There's a piece of your heart that God needs to take care of, to change. Only God can change your heart. So that is the response. And the thing that for many people, they don't see they need anything to change. They have a belief system. Their belief system may be accurate. It may not be. Or they just see the world through eyes that are different than what you and I see through. And one of the lies that they believe that Satan tells is everybody is born a sinner and they can't help it. There's nothing they can do about it. Nothing anybody can do about it. They're born a sinner and they can't help it. I was born this way. I'm born angry. I'm born greedy. You know, I have a tendency to do this, a tendency to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, there's a lot of things people say this to, but the truth is this, everybody's born a sinner and needs to be born again because you are born a sinner. My little granddaughter Paisley, now there's a one and a half year old sinner that's easy to see. I mean, she is as stubborn as I have ever seen a one and a half year old in my life. That girl is stubborn. Now. Is it sin because she knows it? No, because she has a nature of selfishness. She's just selfish. She wants her way. And she's determined to get it. And her mother is selfish. I mean, not selfish, stubborn. But her mother, her mother, don't tell Elizabeth I said she's selfish. I said stubborn. But her mother, my precious daughter-in-law, is born again. She was born stubborn, but she's born again. Now she used stubbornness to live for God and to do what's right. Stubbornness is positive if it's done the right direction. But this little one and a half, she's a pistol. You can ask Austin and Elizabeth, I mean, that girl. I mean, they had the little thing when we dedicated babies last Sunday night. And that girl, she saw that brownie. She saw that cookie that Pastor Anna had out there for them. And she ate a little bit. And she said, well, you, she's wanting it. Uh, uh, uh. And so Elizabeth takes one grape and a fifth of a strawberry. It says, you eat this, and you can have your brownie or cookie. <clears throat> and I kid you not, 
Pastor Elizabeth will tell us, she's just walking in here. For 20 minutes, that girl would not eat that grape, and she would not eat that little fifth of a strawberry to get her brownie. And guess what? Her mother was more stubborn than Paisley. She went home. She did not have a cookie. She did not have a brownie because she knows if you give in to the little things, when the stubborn, sinful uh, personality that you're born with, then you'll give in to everything. And she just doesn't do it. That's what makes her a phenomenal mother. Now, I was a pathetic father because three minutes into it, I said, okay, Austin, here, have the cookie. Shut up. Quit crying. <laughs> she goes, uh -uh, I ain't budging. You can cry all you want. <laughs> I'm doing it. See, we're born sinners. We have a sin nature. And people say you can't help it. And it's true, you can't help it that you're born that way. But there is something that can be done about it. Everybody's born a sinner and needs to be born again. And Jesus does it. And here's what happens when the Holy Spirit makes you born again. And listen to me. He changes your heart. What does that mean, changes your heart? Everybody write this down. Now, this is good stuff. Pastor Huffman, you write this down because you need it worse than anybody here. When you write this down and your heart gets changed, you're going to shave that beard right off. I know the Holy Spirit is going to do it. Yeah. So here it is. When your heart is changed, you're going to see things the way God sees them. You're going to feel about things the way God feels about them. And you're going to think the way God thinks because you're going to renew your mind, which is part of your heart. You're thinking. You're going to feel about it the way. See, that's, that's, that's the key, to feel about things the way God feels because you see it the way he sees it and you think about it the way he thinks about it. You change your heart. God can only change your heart because otherwise your heart will be sinful and selfish and stubborn and everything else and prideful. John chapter 8, Jesus talks about the truth setting you free. When he's doing that, you're free to love. And, and so if you would, turn to, you haven't turned already, turn to John 8. And it says this, am I going too fast for anybody? I can start over and review if you want me to. <laughs> Some of you are going, hurry up, get it over with. <laughs> yeah. To the Jews, verse 31, John 8, Gospel of John. To the Jews who had believed in him, notice they believed in him. They put their belief in Jesus. He said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. In other words, Jesus is saying, you believe in me, but are you really my disciples? A disciple is a learner, a follower of Jesus. I tell our fifth graders, so they can understand the difference between faith and belief, that belief, you know, believes who Jesus is, but faith follows Jesus daily. It follows Jesus daily. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. That's following Jesus daily. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be free? Jesus replied, well, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Listen to me a second. When Jesus would do miracles, he would tell them, go and sin no more. Do we bought this thing that we can't conquer the human desire for self? to sin, to do things, to fill our humanity. We've bought this lie. God doesn't want us to be weak. See, this word is a two-edged sword. It cuts out the flesh. It's more powerful. And when you put the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead on that word, and you fill yourself with prayer and with the word, you become a mighty warrior. You're not weak. We're believers. We're mighty warriors, children of God. It's just that we're so... We're so too busy trying to fill voids and fill our life with things that make life enjoyable and full. And we have a lot of stuff to do that with. Everything under the moon and sun, I mean, we got tons of stuff to do that with. And, and ultimately, we wake up and we're empty. You see, Jesus wants to free us from that, fill us with his word, fill us with his truth, so that we can be more than conquerors, we can be overcomers, in Jesus Christ and not weak. We don't have to subject ourselves to weakness. And so let me clarify what I'm saying. Pastor, you're saying we can be perfect? 
Well, I know some people pretty perfect. I do. I don't know them because I'm not their judge and I can't read their hearts, so I don't have no idea. I haven't attained that, that's for certain. But here's what I am saying. There's a difference between stri- you know, praying and filling yourself and walking with Christ and being an overcomer and a person that desires to be obedient to God and the person who just goes, everybody does it, so it's okay, I'll do it, and they just live in sin. Like they're a salesperson who lies as a lifestyle to make money. Or they're a person that lives in a sin that's a sin of greed or pride or a sin of of uh, thinking they're better than someone, uh, a sin of a sexual sin of some sort that you're just living in. And there's, uh, there's a huge difference between giving over and going, oh, well, can't do anything about it, so I'll just live like this. That's wrong. And you can come up with a lot of reasons why you think it's right, but it's not right. It's wrong. And everybody needs to be born again, and they need the real Jesus in their life in the fullness and the power to save them. There's too many people who know the truth, meaning the plan of salvation, and know about it, and it's presented, and they it's assent to what is true in the Bible, and they believe that, but they've never truly repented and turned from self and cried out, save me from that self, from that flesh, from that evil desire, from that greedy, stubborn, selfish way that, that I was born. You need to be born again, and by the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Now take a look at Galatians 5. You turn with me. And by the way, we use the screens because sometimes we go quickly, but you really ought to use the Bible. I, I wake up every night and pray for a little while, and God tells me stuff. It's when I'm, my mind's slowed down enough to hear, and, you know, when you get old, you need that. But he just said, people need to, like, bring their Bibles to church and, like, t- use them. So don't be lazy marking them. All right, that's enough of that. So it says, stand fast to King James. Oh, you got the NIV on the screen? No, they don't. You don't have that on the screen. It's verse 1. You have to have your Bible. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ made you free, and be not again, again tangled again with the yoke of bondage. The NIV says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, all the way up until this point, Paul is not one time mentioned something you got to do. He's over and over and over mentioned what has happened. And now he says, stay in that liberty. So I don't want you to hear something that I'm not saying. He's talking, particularly in this book, to the Jews who think and are preaching that you got to, if you want to be a Christ follower, if you want, you got to get circumcised. And he gets so blunt that he even, he, I don't even want to say it publicly, just read it. It's really gross what he says in there, talking about emasculating and that. Just look at it. Okay, that'll make you young people want to look at the Bible. So read it, you know. Uh, and, and then he gets down through there, and he's making his point that, you know, it's not by legalism. It's not by something you do or don't do or whatever. It's by a change of heart, okay? And so he says that, that freedom of self and sin and stubbornness is not to live for yourself and be okay doing whatever you want. It's so you can love. So look at verse 13, and we have that on the screen. And it says, you brothers were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Your freedom is to love. That's the title, uh, free to love. And then he says in verse 14, the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if you love God with all your heart and you love others as yourself, you know, you're not, you don't have to worry about sinning because if you're motivated with the heart of love, which faith changes your heart, if you are walking in love, it's going to make a difference what you do. And then he says in verse 15, he says, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Interesting. See, one of the shocking statements in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 13, 3. It says, I can, I can give all my money to the poor, and I can even burn my body, give my body be burned for a cause. But if it's not by love, it's worthless. If it's not love. What? Jesus said, if you, no greater love than this than you have if you lay down your life for a friend. Jesus also talked a lot about true love, gives and does practical things and serves and all that. But, he, but 
But here, he's saying, if you don't, whatever you do, you can give your body to be burned. You can give all the money you want for causes that are good. But if it's not done out of the right motive, out of love, then what good is it? That's 1 Corinthians 13. It's the love chapter. The center of everything is love. It's the center of who we are. In other words, you can make a final sacrifice and be lost forever because your motive isn't right. You know, a lot of people, they believe the truth and they're very committed to the truth. And I think we ought to be truth. The Bible is word of God is true. We ought to stand on it. But you know that if you have truth without love, you've got humanism at its best or a measure of religious activity that has no grace, no mercy, no kindness, no patience, nothing. All you're about is truth. But if you're about love only, you have humanism at its best. I love everybody. It doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. I love, love, love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that's false that we need. No, we need love. We need truth because Jesus is both. The Bible says in 1 John 4, it says, if you, know, if, you know, if you don't love, you don't know God. If you love, you know God. Don't say you know God, and if you don't have love. That's why I'm going to tell you right now, the attributes of love are described for us to check our hearts. And if your attributes of love don't fit you, then we have a problem. You, need, you may just have the definition of being born again, but not had a heart change. Because love loves both the believer and the lost, prefers one another in love, okay? So there's a biblical critique that needs to be applied to everything we do, everything we believe true, every way we teach, every way we share in our witness, everything we do. And I believe our country's free, and I believe in, in, in being politically active, voting, and discussing. But the measure for a Christian has to be critiqued by the biblical mandate to love. That when what we do to stand up for truth, that we're battling for something, it needs to have real love. If we want to bring the message of the Bible to bear on the problems of our world around us, we need to realize that the Bible is much more than a, a radical, much more radical rather, the Bible itself than any political agenda. I mean, Jesus said really radical stuff. So we might want to apply this to this way. Let's just change the verse. Think about our nation and our political agendas. Though you give your body to be burned in the service of your agenda and do not have love, you gain nothing. You see, love can never be equated with anyone's agenda because no agenda is love unless it comes from a certain kind of heart, a heart that's redeemed. So we might be impressed with someone who gives a million dollars to build a, a, a hospital in Africa, but God looks at the heart. What's the motive? Is it look at me? See, Christianity is not a, an agenda for a political activity. It's a power that radically changes the human heart. And when it's lived out and we love people from the heart truly love, it makes all the difference in the world. So do not misunderstand me. I believe in truth. And I believe in discussing things clearly with people and trying to, to be able to share and understand another person's feelings and thoughts. One of the reasons that I don't like any public post on these social media sites about political things is because some people, and, and it can be both ends, uh, they, they don't know that when you're posting something you don't have anger and, and that you're not being loving because maybe they are angry and they're assuming you're responding with anger and and so no matter how you word it they take offense at it and it doesn't change anything it takes away your opportunity to build a relationship and be persuasive and it, and, it, and while you maybe think it's loving it doesn't always come across that way and can i just say that any post if there's a thread of posts that you post on people don't remember that you only said this if someone else that agrees with you said something in an ugly way, you get grouped in with them and accused. Do you understand that? You can't win on social media. I advise you against it. I advise you to have relationships 
and talk with people and share with people and love people and speak truth to people from where, uh, uh, from a true relationship and out of the heart of God's love. The Bible always needs to critique everything we do, including evangelism. I mean, you've heard of the Bible thumpers who are mean and angry and hateful and judgmental. Uh, I mean, but they're preaching truth, the gospel. I mean, think about people of Muslim faith. Some of them are so radical, they have no love, they'll blow themselves up in order to kill other heathens. And yet, they're devoted 100% to what they truly believe, but they're, they're, it's sad. And so, in, in a Christian sense, let's not be that way. Let's be careful with our hearts, okay? And then notice that the command to love uh, is accompanied by the nature of faith. Look at Galatians 5, verse 6. The King James says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. The last part of verse 6 of Galatians 5. In the NIV, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's the thing. True faith changes the heart and makes you, gives you God's heart of love. Uh, no one can say I'm fa saved by faith regardless of whether I love people or not. For the only faith which really saves is faith working through love. Saving faith always gives rise to love, and love gives evidence of true saving faith. Love gives evidence of true saving faith. Paul's attacks on the works of the law, all in Galatians, the circumcision and all that, the works of the law, is not an attack on commands. It's not an attack on obedience. But it's teaching that, that we should, we should try, that, but on the teaching rather, is he's, he's commenting on the teaching that we can somehow try to fulfill the commands in our own strength to earn God's favor or blessing. It's impossible. Okay, that was already settled. Pastor Austin put that in the coffin and nailed it shut. Okay? But that doesn't mean that the commands of God are not good or should be seen as a summons somehow to have the obedience within your own strength. No, it's pointing to say, take a look. Obedience is produced by faith. Remember, he, Pastor Austin said this is the powerful. So, like, if you're taking a note, it's a good thing to, it's a good thing to put on Facebook. Okay? Mark it down. Obedience flows from abiding, not striving. Obedience flows from abiding and not striving. So the logic Paul has here, if we go back to the Galatians 5, verse 13, I want you to notice something. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. What he's saying is there's a, there's, a, there's a negative thing. Don't use freedom as an opportunity for the flesh to just say, I'm free, so it doesn't matter what I do. Paul addresses that in Romans 6. He says, the people are saying, oh, grace abounds. Let us sin more so that grace can abound. And Paul says, God forbid. You don't get it at all. Your heart hasn't been changed. That's not the point. Don't sin. You were baptized, then it talks about baptism. You were put to death, just like Christ died on the cross. When you were baptized, you said no to self and flesh. You were buried in baptizing with him and raised to a new life, a life that isn't caught in sin, but free. Do you see what I'm saying? Are you with me? So negatively, don't use your freedom as an opportunity to the flesh, but positively, use your freedom to, to, to love and be servants one to another. And then the incentive to love because the whole law is fulfilling this one thing, that you love your neighbor as yourself. That's the incentive to love. And the, the, and the negatively, the incentive to love is because if you don't, you're like a wild animal that's hungry, you know, and it says uh, in, in, in verse 15, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, you'll be destroyed by each other. So just picture this, you have a vessel full of water. That vessel represents the Word and the Spirit. You're full of God. And when you go out, what Jesus is saying, you're free, and it's like a river or like a hose to pour it out, and it just flows out of you, that love and truth. It just flows everywhere you go. You're full of God's Word, the truth. You're full of God's Spirit, the love. The Word, the Spirit, love and truth 
balanced and you go and you pour it because you're full. When you're full of God, you're full of His Spirit, you're full of love, you're full of truth, you, you're like a, 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 sp a spring that bubbles up from a mountain, water ground, and it just, it's just it's there, it's just rolling out. But if you're empty and you're religious and you have it in your head but your heart is empty and, and, and you're just you're half full or you're a quarter full or you're, you just don't have much going on in there, you know what I mean? Then what do you do? You're looking for things to satisfy. You're like a vacuum cleaner running around and you, you do, you, you, you know, you're sucking things up and taking things in, trying to satisfy, try to satisfy. When the bag gets full, they take the bag out and throw it in the trash because it was worthless. How many people pursue the things of this world and get old, they realize I've got everything. I look around and I'm still empty. You see, love flows from fullness and flesh flows from emptiness. A wild animal won't take and bite you and devour you unless it's hungry. If it's full, it's good. Okay? We need to be full people so we don't bite and devour each other. Full of God's love is gracious, gracious in speech and kind and forgiving and merciful and, and, uh, and patient and all those things. So, so let's, let's fill ourselves with love. You know, Americans say this, there's a fourth July. I'm an American. It's a free country. I can do whatever I want to do. Or they say, I can say anything I want to say. It's a free country. Well, yeah, maybe in America, but not under Jesus. The freedom, he says, isn't to do that, to do what you want to do and say what you want to say, not caring what anybody thinks. I hear Christians say, I don't care what they think. Really? You should. Don't be mean. See, here's a lie. You're free to do what you want. Here's the truth. You're not free to do what you want. You're free to love and serve. We're free from selfishness, stubbornness, oversensitivity, anger, lust, greedy, pride, sinful self. The freedom we celebrate as Christians is so that we can be free to love and to serve. See, when you live according to the flesh, you're in slavery. But when you serve each other according to the Spirit in love, you're free. Why? Here it is on the screen. Love is motivated by the joy of sharing our fullness. Love is motivated by the joy of sharing the fullness of God in His Spirit, His truth. But the works of the flesh are motivated by the desire to fill up our emptiness. So we look for things of the flesh of the world to fill up our emptiness, and it never will satisfy. See, love doesn't seek its own, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says. And when we love, we're not enslaved. When we love, we're not enslaved to use things or people to fill our emptiness. Love is an overflow, overflow rather, of our fullness. God freed us from guilt, from fear, from greed, and he fills us with his all-satisfying presence. And the only motive left is the joy of sharing that which is full in us, which is God. And when God fills the emptiness of a heart with forgiveness, he filled it there for you to use toward others. Thus, he says, you've been forgiven, forgive. I ask the question, can you really have God's heart and not be quick to forgive? I wonder if that's why Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. Oh, we're a lot more merciful on ourselves. We can be immoral. But if someone says something out of turn, you hold it against them the rest of your li their lives. People devote large chunks of their life trying to get stuff, and they wake up empty. When we're truly free, when God is our portion, God is our stuff that we need to be happy. God and all of his stuff is our stuff. Then we serve one another through love. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. it says. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, here's what it looks like. It's a pretty hard command to follow. It means wanting to feed the hungry as much as you want to feed yourself when you get hungry. It means you want to find your neighbor a job as much as you're glad you have a job. It means that you want to help your fellow student get an A as much as you want to get an A. 
It means you want to help the person stall on the freeway as much as you're glad you're not the one stalled on the freeway. It means you want to give the poor softball player a chance to play the some instead of playing the whole game. It means you want to share Christ with your neighbor as much as you are so glad that you found Christ in his grace and kindness to you. God is saying we need to care what happens to others as much as you care about what happens to you. Just look at the person to the right or left. Just think if you cared about them as much as you care about yourself. When the Bible says love others as you love yourself, listen to me, that's not, that's not teaching about self-esteem and trying to teach you, love yourself, love yourself, put yourself first. No, that's not teaching that. It's talking about you already naturally have a care for yourself, that you take care of yourself. It's just ingrained. And it's saying that same thing that's ingrained in you to take care of yourself, you need to feel toward others as the Holy Spirit puts it there. So can you imagine what a church would look like if we were like that, looking at the person to the right and to the left and feeling the same longing for their happiness that we feel for our own happiness? Not only would the law be fulfilled because we love and we, we, we love our neighbor as ourself, but this place would be exploding with joy and the glory of the Lord because we'd be free from self and sin and flesh, pride and greediness and everything else. And God would show up in a great way and people would be converted because that's the power of the Spirit working through people. Otherwise, we might only have religion. A church of people, the tragic alternative of love is that a church of people who don't serve each other in love will destroy itself. I'm glad for 28 years of love, for the most part, of grace, of forgiving, of not talking about things, even though they're true, that would hurt another. Just because it's true doesn't mean you get to repeat it unless they're a part of the solution. When you pass on something that's sad that happened, someone made a mistake, and you, even if it's in a prayer request, shame on you. You tell nothing that doesn't build people up to anyone unless the person you're telling is part of the solution. Otherwise, it's gossip. And for the most part, we've followed that. Let me ask you this. Imagine the surprise for some people when scientists finally find the center of the universe and they report that you weren't in the center. <laughs> Mr. Witzke posted that. I loved it. It went right with my sermon. I thought, I'm using that one. And then the last slide, I close with this. Musicians, if you come. And the lie is opposite to a person that doesn't like church who's not religious. He says to that person, you don't, have to be a, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, it may be true, but I can tell you one thing, if you truly are a Christian, you love the church because the church isn't the institution, the leadership, it's the people of God. We are the church, not a building. We come together because everybody has burdens and we bear one another's burdens. We pray one for another, we love each other, we encourage each other, we exhort each other, we care. Coming together is important, guys. Being in church matters, right? It matters. And, and I just believe that's a lie. The truth is, when you have God in you, Jesus died for the church to make it spotless. God gave his son for the church because it's, we're the body of Christ, it says. So yeah, I think you ought to love the church and go to church. But here's the lie to church people that may be religious or may have drifted into Circumcision, so to speak, not exactly, but legalism, but religion that I don't like this and I don't like that and do this. And I, I get it as long as you have love, there's things that are right and wrong. I get that. But here's the lie. I'm okay. I'm okay with God if I'm active in church. You can be active in church. Some of the most wicked people I know growing up in church were the people that never missed church and they were mean as a junkyard dog. And you know it too. I don't think you're that way. I don't. Here's the truth. You're okay with God when you have been set free from your sinful self. You're okay with God when you've been set free from pride. You're okay with God when you uh, are set free from greed and lust. You're okay with God when Jesus comes in and makes you free from the flesh and now makes you alive in the spirit, a new creation. You're okay with God when you've been set free to love, to serve, and forgive. 
most Christians, that's where it stops. I'll love and serve, but don't you bring up forgiving. You always say you got to forgive. That's right, but I'm not the one that originated it. It might be a little empty spot. Your glass may not be full. The fuller you get, the less you need of the world to fill you. The fuller you get, the more natural it is that your heart flows out to people with love, which opens the door for truth that is given with honey. Right? More to be desired are they than fine gold, yea, than fine gold, sweet as the honeycomb, the Word of God. That's when God's love is on it. But it can be really ugly and push people away from the true God if we're not filled with love. You know what? I'm not a, a great preacher, never have been. If people visit this church, and before I did all the preaching, they go, how in the world did you get all those people coming there? I thought the same thing. I said, I don't know. I didn't want them to come. That makes more work. Pastor Brett singing, that must be it. But wait a minute, it was growing before he came. This beautiful Pastor Jeff, yeah, but it was growing before he came. All these people came. And I'll tell you what it is. It's love. Because God put love in my heart. Like Keith Green, the song, you put this love in my heart. Uh, 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 uh. That's when it was cool, baby. Uh -huh. I was cool one day. That was the cutting edge stuff right there. Yeah, it wasn't River Valley Band or anything like that. It was Keith Green. Pretty good records is what he called them. Last Days Ministry. Best music ever written. I didn't understand that. He put this love. He did. I don't, I don't know why I love some of you. You're not very lovable. I don't know why you love me because I'm not always real lovable. But it doesn't mean I don't love, right? That's why I be gracious and forgive because we're going to have moments that we're more like acid than honey, right? And we need grace and kindness in those moments. Let's be the church. So here's my call to you. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, get up here and ask Jesus to change your heart because that's the only way you can be changed. I can't offer you a formula. I can't pray you into it. And if you are saved and you think there's a measure of a lacking of fullness and you find yourself running about trying to fill that with some sort of earthly thing, then we need to fit more Jesus. And if you find yourself struggling with really it being easy to love, the more God you have, it's like the old song. They got it when the Holy Spirit would move. It makes me love everybody. He makes me love everybody. How many know that? Man, I remember hugging stinky people when I got filled with the Spirit, got full up of God. And it didn't I remember they stunk, but it didn't seem to matter. I hugged them. I don't know what I was thinking. So let's stand together. And as we sing this prayer song, change my heart, oh God. Pastor Brett, sing it. Get on up here and get more God in your heart. Come on, everybody.